eventually becoming a university professor. In 1990, Morgan and his wife, Isola Preston, wrote a seminal book entitled The Edge of Campus, a journal of the black experience at the University of Arkansas, which examines the first 40 years of campus life since desegregation began in 1948. Gordon is a member of the Black Alumni Association and the Arkansas Alumni Association. Gordon has also been a member of his fraternity, Omega Psi Phi, for 69 years and brought the Gamma Eta chapter to the University of Arkansas in 1974. Morgan received the Silas Hunt Legacy Award, a National Endowment for the Humanities Teaching Fellowship, and a Ford Foundation Fellowship, among many many other honors. He and his wife also established the Gordon Morgan Family Scholarship for minority, minority students here at the U of A. After 43 years as a faculty member, Dr. Morgan retired and took emeritus status in 2012. What a stellar record and what a great career. Combined, Clark and Morgan put in 72 years on this campus. nurturing students, mentoring students, and teaching students. We're so glad the two of you chose to call this university home for all those many years. Though I know you may have had opportunities and temptations from time to time to explore opportunities at other universities. We're glad you stayed. Above and beyond being great teachers and scholars, Clark and Morgan also played a critical and consistent role in helping make the university a more welcoming place for all who came, showing students the path towards success through their words and also, more importantly, through their actions. They helped the university better live up to its reputation and promise and provided subsequent African-American faculty with shoulders to stand on as they began their own careers. Margaret and Gordon, we greatly appreciate your long-standing service to this university. This is our way of saying thanks for all you have done to make this university a better place to work, a better place to study, and a better place to live. Congratulations to you and your family. Studied in France and taught high school before making her 
very impatient, and she set a high bar for what was to come. This week, Margaret told me one of her proudest moments on the faculty. She had a student that was struggling in French, but Margaret encouraged him and helped him extensively, and ultimately, he straight by and passed the class. Months later, she encountered the same student on the sidewalk, visibly dejected. She asked what was wrong, and again, he was failing French. He would have to pass the class in order to get his degree. Eventually, Margaret advised the student to drop and take the class later with her, and that's what he did. And Margaret met with the student months later when he enrolled in her class. She met with the student weekly to help him improve. Again, he narrowed and succeeded. A few years after that, the student wrote Margaret and revealed that on that day that she stopped to speak with him, he had been on his way to withdraw from the university. But now that same student was only one year away from completing his PhD. So that's the kind of parent support we would like for all our students to experience. So 15 years after my class with Margaret, I was back in the working and I was encountered on campus and around I recall how impressed I had been with her as my professor. I was serving on the board of the Washington County Historical Society, and eventually I recruited her to serve on our board. I think Margaret was a little surprised, but ultimately she accepted and has been an active member of our board ever since. I'm very grateful that Margaret said yes because over the years it has allowed me to form a truly cherished friendship, one that continues to know. I could report a few board members have had a bigger impact on the historical society. She's contributed in many ways, but in particular, Martin has led our efforts to chronicle and celebrate the experiences of different waves of diverse settlers to Northwest Arkansas. Her leadership has helped us tell the rich stories of African American and Hispanic and Marshallese Arkansans in Washington County, including a recent program, program on African American entrepreneurs and Sherman's Tavern, an iconic and uniquely diverse gathering place. Margaret's optimism, her steady perseverance, her capacity to see the best in others, her community involvement, her lifelong passion for teaching, for learning, for ideas and understanding, and her personal grace, kindness, and wisdom are qualities that we would like to foster in all of our graduates. For this reason, it is highly appropriate to name this all
contributions to the U of A and to our great state of Arkansas. I noticed that the year she received her BA in foreign languages, from Lada, of course, from your Arkansas a and &E College, was the year I was born in another town in Arkansas, far to the north and east of Iowa. You can back check that later. <laughs> and I eventually found my way to sit at the feet of this great American woman and draw upon her wisdom and knowledge as one of the fortuitous events of my life. I knew of Dr. Clark as a graduate student in the Master of Arts German program, but I first met Dr. Clark when I returned to the U of A to enroll in the teacher education program. I was able to enroll as a non-degree seeking student who knew that she couldn't teach without a license in those days. And Dr. Clark's methods of teaching foreign languages was on the list. Two things struck me on that first day of class. Dr. Clark was dressed to the nines. Professional and stylish. And she was light years ahead of the pedagogical game in implementing communicative language teaching methodology. I vowed to emulate her teaching methods in my own classroom as well as imitate her impeccable sense of fashion. Fast forward to the present century when I returned to the U of A again to enroll in the PhD program in curriculum and instruction. And lo and behold, there was Dr. Clark. Professor Harris, still teaching the methods, of course. This time, I was in her class as her teaching intern. We reconnected, and she began to shepherd me through the process of becoming a servant scholar in language education. Little did I imagine that I would be filling those lovely ideal shoes a few years later before you did. Dr. Clark's contribution to the field of language pedagogy extends from local to national. At the state level, she assisted in developing and piloting four courses now required for teaching English to speakers in other languages. At the national level, she joined other professionals in the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages to establish the oral proficiency assessment standards used today. Dr. Clark's legacy of language teachers is extensive. When I look around this room, I see several generations of her teachers. As a keynote speaker for one of our conferences, I asked the audience of nearly 70 foreign languages to stand if they had been a student of Dr. Clark. Almost two-thirds of the audience rose to applaud their remarkable professor. Dr. Clark's service also extends beyond the boundaries of her state through her leadership in the Arkansas East Bolivia chapter of the Partners of the Americas. As current Northwest Arkansas Regional Vice President and Chair of the Education Committee of the Arkansas East Bolivia Chapter, Dr. Clark organizes visitors to and from Bolivia for educational and cultural exchanges. In fact, we have a former teacher and resident here today, Josefina Milan, from Bolivia American Center in Santa Cruz.
Thank you, sir. 
church and, and service. And so we all say, yeah, we teach, do research and service. You know, in fairness, we probably kind of do each of those. Most of us as faculty members do one of them really well, we kind of move around with another one and look the other way on the third. Uh, Gordon Morgan would like that. Gordon Morgan did all three of those. Today, I want to focus on two parts of his career that, that I think are major reasons of why we're here today. That's the teaching and the scholarship. Let's talk about the teaching. Gordon was an amazing teacher. He always taught a full load of courses. And in those days, that was three or four courses a semester. Today, it's somewhat less than that. Uh, but Gordon and I don't really care. We don't feel too bad about it most of the time. Gordon often, though, in addition, that there wasn't a single faculty member I ever remember over my time that taught more courses than Gordon did each semester. And not only that, but almost every semester, at least once a year, Gordon would say, you know what we have to do? We have to offer such and such a Caribbean class to our students. We'd say, Gordon, we can't get that in the schedule. We don't have anybody who can teach it. Gordon says, I'll teach it. I'll teach it as an overload. Sorry, Gordon, we don't have any money to pay you as an overload. And with, he would get offended at that. And he'd say, I'm not doing it for the money. The students need this class, and I want to do it. That's what a good teacher does. Gordon always worked at his teaching. A lot of faculty lament the fact that they say, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to cover all the material. I never heard Gordon say that. What I did hear him say is, I sure hope I can uncover a lot of that material. Because he went out teaching in a somewhat different way than a lot of people do. Gordon had one thing that he really wanted out of his students, and that is to be able to present sociology, which was his life force. He was able to present sociology and get them to think about it. He didn't want them to memorize facts, he wanted them to think about it. Whatever it took to get that done, Gordon did it. I have seen him write plays where he had his students perform parts of the play. And in those parts, it helped them understand concepts like social class and what it feels like to be in different social classes. Uh, and he not only did plays, but he would bring in pictures, some of them, but it was scary. Uh, and sometimes he'd just bring in stuff that, uh, what is he doing? He's got a bunch of trash. What's he taking that? saw the way he was doing. What you saw was he was using these props. He schemed. He did whatever he could do to get the students not just to memorize facts. He wasn't a scuffer of facts. What he was was a person that got somebody to think about them, to think about the issue. And from my point of view, that is the definition of what teaching is. And Gordon did it, and he did it for 43 years, and he did it more than Anybody else did it, and he did it well. It was, it was just amazing. In the second area of his work, his scholarly work, I always say that I don't ever remember a single day, and I knew Gordon for a long time, I don't ever remember a single day that he didn't sit down at his desk and write. And he wrote his scholarship, and he did it every day, and it didn't matter what else was going on. Gordon was a scholar. Gordon was a sociologist. He had over 70 publications in his, in his uh, career. One of them with his wife, Dr. Morgan. Uh, this is Dr. Dr. Morgan here. Uh, and that was on the edge of campus. I liked the original title of that book better, by the way. It was In the Shadow of Old Lady. Uh, both good titles, but uh, you get to go with the, the title you want. Gordon wrote every day, and whether he published it or not, and he's got many books, he's got published articles, letters to the editor, but every day Gordon wrote something about life that's viewed through the eye of a sociologist. Whether it was a book, a professional article, or a letter to the, to the journal, to, to the editor, Gordon believed the job of a social scientist was to analyze social life and share his insights with others. That was important, that he write it down, that he share his insights with others. And when I say every day, I gratefully mean every day. Gordon and I shared an office late in both of our careers. 
truth be told, we we'll probably have cumulative 185 years of life on campus, which is probably more than half of the rest of the sociology department put together. But anyway, the, the odd couple shares their shares their office. And I kept watching Gordon working every day on his manuscripts and carefully taking the things out and writing and carefully then putting them back in. And I said, you know, my scholarship went a long time ago. And I said, Gordon, what are you doing? You're probably not even going to get that company. And Gordon said, I'm a sociologist. And that's what I do. In the store. If you didn't write something this past week, I would be so very, very surprised. I won't mention his, his, his service, but he did yeoman service probably more than any three of the, of the rest of us. But I talked about the teaching and research, but had they ever asked me, should we name a building after Gordon Morgan if I was big in? If they would have asked me why, I would have come up with a slightly different reason than I've given right now as to why I think this building was named after Gordon Morgan. I haven't mentioned what I think is Gordon's greatest contribution. And that's a contribution to the lives of students on this campus who were struggling to adjust to power who were struggling to adjust to a new environment, who were struggling to adjust to a new living environment, who were struggling to adjust to the, to the demands of the college course, who were, who were missing mom and dad, and Gordon Morgan. Those were the students that Gordon Morgan tried to help. He helped in many ways you can't even imagine. But of course, he joined the faculty in 1973. And those are something I've never seen in them. And that's this line, this line of people and building around outside the world's up. And I never seen, you know, like a what is going on? I asked one of my colleagues. I said, does Gordon require students in his class to come to his office after class? And the answer was, no, some of those people are students that are in his class. Some of them are students that were in his class in the past. Some of them are students that just know him. Some of them are students whose father and mother said, you get to know Gordon Morgan, you hear me? Uh, and they did, so they came, and his door was always open. There was never a time when Gordon wasn't willing to see a student. What he was doing was advising, but he didn't do advising in the way I think of advising. When we talk about course selection, we talk about career opportunities. Advising for Gordon meant helping somebody get over a failed romance. Providing hints for what to do in the class that we're having trouble with. Lending a caring ear to somebody whose family was, was having trouble. Being a friend to somebody who didn't have a friend. Those were the way that Gordon advised, and he advised students from all over the camp. And I am absolutely positive. I never saw it with my own eyes, but I am positive that sometimes it involved reaching into his pocket, taking our own money lunch for a hungry student, or maybe for a special day. Gordon Morgan was a rock star. He was a prime pilot. He was a pop icon before we even used that term. And I know that line of students who were out in front of his office. I know that there were, when he went home, a lot of telephone calls, many calls that came at very odd hours. I once even suggested, Gordon, why don't you get an unlisted and he looked at me like I was a kid, which I probably was. Gordon said, when they need me, I have to be different. I think Dr. Morgan, she got the work, Dr. Wright's a little I think she could probably tell us how much went on at home. But I think I saw a lot of Morgan kids get special awards for what they have done in lending their husband and mother to the students of the University of Arkansas at whatever hour of the day it needed to be done. It's kind of hard to sum up what Gordon meant to the students. A student did it for me, isn't that a surprise? But at a retirement party we had for Gordon, there were a number of students there. And there was this one student, and I knew he was graduating, and I knew he was in the middle of final exams, and I knew he was busy because he had something he was doing outside. And I said, what is there that makes Gordon Morgan so special that you're going to come out here when you visit? Don't catch me like I was an idiot. And he talked for a minute, and he finally said, just honestly, he said, he's a cool dude. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, students come to 
through all the fancy words and all the sociological descriptions, and they get to the heart of that. What I saw clearly was in addition to his extraordinary achievements in teaching and research, he had the ability to connect with students at their level. He listened. He was interested in it. He cared. It showed. And they knew it. Even at 80 plus years of age, he was a cool dude. That's probably the highest possible score you can get on a student's rate by professor. <laughs> Let me end by, by saying how appropriate it is that this particular building he named the court. And it's not named because he was a major donor, although he and I still have two now scholarships at the University of Arkansas and one at Washington State. So he is a major donor, but that's not why. And he was never a senior administrator. Good for you. <laughs> he was a faculty member who worked hard at his job and did it every day in his life. And for me, it's perfect. This is a building that students come to to live on the hundreds of hours when they're not in classrooms. And those were the times that Gordon was able to really help a student. He was interviewed by the prior center a few years ago. And I I encourage all of you to look at that interview on the prior side. And Gordon had a quote for me that sums up his mission. He said, I want the University of Arkansas to see a kid and see potential. And then to see that potential realized. Achieving potential occurs in the classroom and out of the classroom, in the library and in a building like this. And that's where you always have a good I hope that students years to come to live in the world of North Paul. We'll realize this name is a testament to what universities are all about, teaching the search of service, and working every day in every way to help students reach their potential. I do wish that there was some way we could let them know that their home is named after a cool dude. <laughs> Please join me in recognizing a cool dude been an exemplary, compassionate professor, a mentor and supporter for generations of students and faculty members, and I can guarantee personally as one faculty member who was mentored by Gordon Martin. Gordon, congratulations.
then she opened the door for me. So I ended up being valedictorian of the high school because the girl had fun. <laughs>
So no matter what I said or what I say, I enjoy the universe of Arkansas experience for these 44 years. Thank you kindly for your recognition and my beautiful efforts at the university. She had Madam Clark coming to her class and helping the interns out. So she and Margaret Clark go a long way. Finally, I found out who it was. And I said, you're talking about Dr. Margaret Clark, aren't you? And she said, it's Madam Clark. <laughs> well, and that's my daughter who was the shy fairy. There aren't a lot of them. But uh, there was one shy fairy. And I didn't see how she ever was going to get through it a teacher, and it was because I think of people like Margaret Clark, Madam Clark, who, were, who was able to help her, inspire her. She is now Madam King, <laughs> and she is at Springdale in the high school, and she has finished 29 years of teaching French, and it would not have happened without caring, strong, good teaching faculty who not only taught in the ivory tower rooms, but who got out and came into the classroom and who taught it wouldn't happen without people like Madam Clark. So as a father, I thank you. <laughs> Margaret Clark was widely recognized as an outstanding teacher. She received the Outstanding Teacher Award from Pam Hellenic. But her teaching didn't just occur on college with college students like my daughter. She taught English as a second language to teachers who were out who were out in the schools who needed that kind of additional as our community changed 
and we began to have more and more people where English wasn't the primary language. They needed, the teachers needed to know how to do the ESL work. Margaret Clark to the rescue. She did a series of workshops and later turned those workshops into classes and later turned those classes into a graduate degree, a master's in, in education that's still being offered. So her service goes well beyond the students that are, that are in her classroom. And if that isn't enough, she got grants and held conferences, and the conferences would bring people in from all over the state and all over the region. They were well attended, they were well put on. She had outstanding speakers. How in heaven's name she got Leon Panetta to come to one of her workshops. I think she's gonna go to her grave with that, with that information, but she did do it. And if it wasn't enough to deal with Arkansas and the region, Margaret Clark went international with her teaching. And she offered courses as far away as Athens, Greece. All of us who teach, all of us who teach, know, I guess we want to believe, that we not only have the students sitting in that seat, but that maybe that student's uh, on the top, maybe we might influence that student in another way, that there, there might be some kind of multiplier effect in our teaching. Margaret Clark doesn't have to wonder about that. She can look, as we heard earlier, at the generations of teachers that she has spawned. The teachers who have taught literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of students, what a legacy for Maggie Clark. Congratulations, young lady. <laughs> We've heard about some of her, uh, her contributions and Margaret's contributions. Uh, I am particularly interested in the fact she was, by, by the way, the first African American president of the uh, Arkansas chapter of the Association of University Women. She did work with the professional women in the state. Margaret came along at a time when the society was finally, I emphasize finally, beginning to recognize the importance of women in the workforce and what the contribution they made. And women had to, to also learn to move into that role. And it was people like Margaret Clark who were able to do that and were able to help, to help her peers. So just as her contributions are recognized in the classroom across the state of Arkansas, I think her effect to promote professional women is being recognized still among now daughters and perhaps granddaughters. She did a lot of work here at the university. I won't go through all of the committees. I can't because there were so many of them that uh, it would take the rest of our lives to go through them. But she did. You know, I, I always thought of Margaret Clark as kind of a Forrest Gump of the University of Arkansas. Because whenever something important happened, there was Margaret Clark. <laughs> she was on the athletic committee. When the athletic committee moved the university from the Southwest Conference to the SEC, a really big deal in those days, there was Margaret Clark. But unlike Forrest Gump, she didn't just stand there. She was a mover. She influenced those she was the kind of person that you needed to have on an important committee at that time. Uh, she served on more committees than, than I can even begin today. I think the most difficult and I'm congratulated for it. She served for several years on the All University Judiciary, which I consider the toughest duty that any college person has to do. And I can remember she was on that committee when I was chancellor, and there was a tough case coming up. And I think we're going to be okay. She served on some search committees, not just some search committees, but you know, half the faculty in some college were selected by a search committee that Margaret Clark was on, but she was also on some really seminal search committees. She was on the search committee that selected Alan Sullivan, president of the U of A system, Don Lovett's predecessor, and he served for 22 years. An important judge. She was on the search committee that selected Dave Gerhardt as the head of development. And that led to two things. One, a billion dollar campaign, that's a fee, billion dollar campaign for the University of Arkansas, and an eminently respected and 
successful chancellor. There is a but on Margaret's record, <laughs> She also served on the search committee in 1985 that selected Chancellor Rivera. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Bowles. I was so pleased. 
continues when it was that you, one of my own students, was a, going to be named to be the person who had replaced me, at least half all of that that I had been doing, in as much as the ESL was being, doing, being accomplished by someone else. But I, it made my heart warm to know that you were that person. I want to thank you too, Attorney Bill Kincaid, for those words that you said about me and for nominating me to the Washington County Historical Society. In the beginning, when you did that, I said to you, I don't know why you're trying to nominate me. You know, I'm not a historian. I don't know anything about this. And what I discovered down the road was that education is a two-way transactional street. And so you unconsciously named me, nominated me. And I have discovered over the years that, yes, I do know something about history. But more importantly, not that I know about history, but I want to have others share and learn about it. And thusly, it was that I started doing that series of programs about uh, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, Latino Americans, and, uh, and the Abrahamic faiths that are reflected in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, how did I get to the university? There are three particular persons that I need to mention. The first one is one of my aunts who married someone and moved to Pine Bluff. And it was she that brought me to Arkansas. Her name is Mrs. Ollie M. Merriman. And because of that, I was able to attend Arkansas A. College where I met my fellow honoree <laughs> who maintains that I, if I were in the class, that he couldn't get the A. I don't remember that. <laughs> no, it was did. And uh, but so after a couple of years, when I had returned to kind of up, and married Oren Clark, I started teaching French and English. Those were subjects, well, the French particularly, was a, a subject that was very dear to my heart. And so I had met the, the second person who is very important in my life, and that is Ms. Wilma Jemison. She was the state specialist the state specialist for foreign languages. It was she who came to visit my school, my classes, and she was aware of the kind of work that I was doing there at Merrill High School in terms of getting money from the international paper company and setting up a lab and doing all kinds of things to make the class more interesting, similar to the kinds of classes I had had in my school in New York. And so when it came time for me to apply to go to workshops um, in the summer, the French first level workshop that I went to at Rutgers University, she was the person who supported me and wrote the letters to encourage me to be able to do that. She did that again when I was applying for the second level, which was being conducted by the University of Massachusetts in Akasha Cross. And then she also was that person who said, okay, um, what, what comes next? And I told her that I was going to apply for a Fulbright, a Fulbright page to be able to study in France at the University of Paris for a year. And she wrote that again for me. So, I did echoes, and then when I returned to Arkansas, 
I discovered Ms. Jemison is about to come up with a committee that was going to draft suggestions of ways by which foreign language teaching across the state of Arkansas could be improved. They had been a study group and they discovered that Arkansas language would be first. And I thought, oh my goodness. And so on that committee was a third person who was important in my life. And that third person was Dr. Lawrence Wynn. Larry Wynn was the person who said, what you need to do is to apply for this full year fellowship to come to the University of Arkansas and study to get a master's degree in French. And I did. And um, you know, I kind of knew that I would probably get that fellowship because of him. And then, after getting that degree in French, the next thing I know, Dr. Wynn said, uh, a year after I had gone back to my high school, Dr. Wynn informed me that he was suggesting, along with one of my other major professors, that I should be a visiting instructor in the summer of 1969 for a workshop that was going to be done for the teachers in the state of Arkansas. And so it was that I came for that. But simultaneously, he had said, you are going to be, um, you, we are putting forth your name to be a part-time instructor at the University of Arkansas teaching French starting in the fall of 1969. That is how I got here. And how did I stay? It was because Dr. Gabriel Taylor and Dean Escalani after I had completed my studies in for the doctorate, then they said, we're going to offer you a, a second half-time job as an assistant professor over in the college of Aid. And so I stayed. Now, I want to add one last little section, and that is about what the university has given me, what I have gotten from it. And that is, first of all, that education. Secondly, that employment of 38 years after retiring, as you've heard, I kept going until the end of the summer of 2007. And thirdly, it is a lot of friends, friends who have come as a result of being colleagues, friends that have come as a result of being our students, friends because I, an only child without any siblings, a person who has had no children, then that, that is how I now have a family friends who have come to me through my colleagues and my students. Third. The fourth thing is the opportunities that this university has enabled me to have. And I will point out just one example of how that has influenced me because it is that I was able to travel and go to meetings not only in the U.S., but more importantly, abroad. And when I went, you, I, I found myself getting these different perspectives on things. And it's important for me that I get perspectives that are not narrow. I had learned as a child from one of my family, my, my family friends, that if you take a half dollar and hold it up to your eye and close the other one, and he said, what do you see? And I said, I see an half dollar. And he said, OK, hold it sideways. And now what do you see? And I said, oh, I can see X, Y, and Z things. He says, keep that in mind. You should always be aware that there are other possibilities, other ways of viewing things, other things that can be important. And so when I went on a 
these trips. Oh, I discovered different perspectives. Dean of Heritage, Cynthia Nance, and I were going to Brunei for a conference on teaching tolerance. And when we arrived, we were filling out the forms that had been given to us. And one of the questions on the form was that religion. And so we were writing down Christian. And there were those on the plane who were writing down that they were Jewish. And to our surprise, those individuals were not allowed to get off the plane. Contrastively, my friend Dr. Brendan Turk and I were over for a conference in the country of Oman. And we were surprised, pleasantly so, to discover that the Sultan of Oman had had built one church and one synagogue for all of the workers the foreign workers who were there in this country. Different perspectives, important in life. And fifthly, the last one, is the fact that there have been spin-offs. All because of the fact that I'm here at this university and I have been able to be involved in so many different kinds of organizations. And because of that, I have gotten to be in them as a result of my friendships with colleagues, my friendships with students, and you've heard about the eight, the um, uh, Partners of the Americas, you've heard about the um, American Association of University Women, and you've heard about uh, my sorority. All of these things are very important to me, and they give me that blanket of friendship. And because of that, those five things, I feel so grateful and so honored. It's hard really to put things in words to express your gratitude. Now, as Antoine de saint exupéry said, on ne voit rien avec le cœur, l'essentiel est and the deceived of was here. It's only with the heart that one can see clearly. And what is essential is invisible to the eyes. So to express my appreciation and my gratitude, I ask you to use your heart from my heart.
enjoy the refreshments in the back. Yeah, that's it.